My name is Hiro Kawashima, the CEO of Prescience Health and your host of the Prescience Health audio blog series. We'll be inviting a variety of subject matter experts to weigh in on topics ranging from AI applications in healthcare to trends in nursing. This week, our guest is Chris Luby, an experienced healthcare executive, a faculty member at the American College of Healthcare Executives, and professor at various colleges. He started his career working in hospitals. Welcome to the audio blog, Chris. Uh, welcome, Hero. Glad to be here. Let's start uh, with your experience overseeing operations in hospitals. Um, how do you plan for unit coverage today? Um, the way that uh, I plan for unit coverage uh, in the acute care uh, environment that uh, I managed for many years is we looked at the type of patients that we were going to see, and we thought about the typical work that was involved with uh, that patient load um, and then we and then we did that in relation to how much time so we could calculate the hours of care that uh, would be needed for the volume that we expected to see. Got it that makes sense. Um, what are some of the challenges then that you've seen or heard of when it comes to to planning for unit coverage or optimizing unit coverage? Well the challenges are going to be uh, first of all variability and volume that uh, is experienced. Some units very stable, um, but other units have a wide variety of, uh, or wide variability of volume that is uh, different day to day. There's not a pattern uh, per se that uh, people can readily uh, perceive. And often those patterns, if they are there, they're not perceived because they're subtle more than the human uh, then humans can readily detect that part of that variability is the type of patients that will be seen or the amount of care that the, that the volume of patients will need. Got it. Um, and when it comes to thinking about some of the benefits of optimizing unit coverage, what do you see uh, when you're operating a hospital? Well, I think the key thing when organizations uh, would think about optimizing coverage is um, getting the right people in, in the right amount at the right place at the right time. And the right people is in the right amount. Um, if you have very severe patients, severely sick or acutely ill and sick, um, do we have the, uh, they require more time and do we have people, enough people to handle that workload? And then how do we balance that out across the, um, the people who are caring for patients so that nobody feels overloaded. Um, so we can think of if I'm a nurse and I've got four patients, do I have the four sickest patients or do I have the four uh, least sick patients or a combination of uh, sick and not so sick people so that I can make the rounds get to everybody and provide the care that I need or that they need. I see. And when you align the right nurse with the right patient at the right time, right place, what kind of benefits uh, do you think you see when it comes to things like throughput uh, or even average length of stay? Well, I think the, the key thing is, is that we can apply the, uh, that the, the team can apply the care that's needed, uh, make sure that uh, that medications are given, that the appropriate checks are, are made with people, um, and in particular things like uh, um, med turns, pain management, these key factors that can drive uh, length of stay or cause individuals to remain in the hospital longer than they might otherwise. If the nurses, if the nursing team can't get back to the patient frequently enough, uh, they might miss um, picking up some signs of increasing pain on the part of an individual or difficulty ambulating or some other things that could then cause for um, a length of stay increase. So we really want to make sure that uh, the nursing team has a chance to uh, see all patients that are under their care uh, with enough frequency and an appropriate basis to monitor, manage, um, and intervene when it's appropriate. 
I think that makes a lot of sense when it comes to making sure that uh, you have the right type of care so that uh, the patients can get to a point of discharge um, as soon as possible, uh, and obviously when the patient is ready. Um, so today, most hospitals are still utilizing antiquated systems uh, when it comes to determining what type of staff and, and how many staff members are needed for the well, that's, coverage. That's, that's pretty much the case. In fact, what's really interesting is even in one of the continuing education uh, nursing uh, documents that uh, was, uh, is currently in use, published last year, uh, there's... Uh, and this is a training manual. Um, it says that um, the uh, nursing manager uh, must make an educated guess. This is a direct quote out of a training manual. Must make an educated guess as to how many full-time equivalents are needed to cover departmental needs majority of the time. And it uh, says in another spot um, that they still are talking about the use of a midnight census as the key indicator of how they're going to staff the unit and they struggle right here it says every nurse leader struggles with the midnight census being the measurement of work because it doesn't reflect the activity that goes on throughout the daytime shift of admissions discharges transfers so they're using an old finance driven and reimbursement driven metric the midnight census to drive their staffing model when the daytime census might be uh, double of what the midnight census is or the workload might be dramatically higher because of admissions and discharge the discharges that are occurring the day, during the day and this is so this is in a training manual this is one of the wow. Uh, continuing education pieces that nurses today right now could uh, access online and receive continuing education credits by reading about how to do this in such an antiquated uh, fashion it's quite surprising it is so then how do you think forecasting can help uh, nurses uh, better optimize unit coverage well the forecasting is going to take all that guesswork out um, because we're going to be then thinking about um, midnight. We're going to forecast on what the midnight unit volume is going to be and maybe even the acuity. If, if uh, that is available for forecasting, we can do that, of course. Um, but we can also have a separate and differential forecast at 6 in the morning, at noon, at 3 in the afternoon. In fact, uh, depending on the departments uh, and their the variation of how they work or the variability of volume, say an emergency department, that can be predicted on an hourly basis and fluctuate. And uh, as that fluctuates, you can then uh, determine how you're going to staff. And since you can't change staffing hourly, it does help the nursing team prepare for what's going to happen an hour or two from now, from now so that they can uh, better pace themselves with the workload that they're dealing with right now if they know that workload is going to go up in a couple hours or it's likely to go down in a couple hours due to what the uh, predictive forecast might indicate uh, the volume is going to be. Hmm. And then how do you suggest that some of these institutions adopt forecasting or even nurses adopt forecasting? Obviously, change management in healthcare is a very difficult process um what have you seen and what would your advice be to to nurses out there well that's a great question uh, um having talked with a um, a uh, chief nursing officer when i've been giving a presentation uh, a seminar on uh, the use of uh, analytics to drive better success in an organization and this particular uh chief nursing officer said what they do in their organization is as a nurse signs on to the uh, their computer their workstation in the unit uh, the first screen that they see that they have to um, acknowledge that they've taken a look at is a screen that shows them what the upcoming volume is expected over the next four to six hours on the unit and then separate from that what's going to, what's the outlook for the next shift and what she said she's found is that nurses now pay attention to what their workload is so that they don't uh, for lack of a better term uh, leave work or 
or dump it on the next shift, if you will. They wow. make sure that in differently than she'd seen, and this is a uh, chief nursing officer the, uh, of uh, you know long duration, a very experienced individual, and she said she has seen a definite behavior change in the nurses on each shift, making sure that they have all of their work done because the next shift knows that what they're dealing with, the evening shift, knows that, that their workload was, the potential for their workload was seen by the earlier shift. And so people are paying more attention to what uh, they leave behind for the next next crew. That makes a lot of sense. And I think uh, you know, these types of triggers or even nudges are what's going to drive some of these uh, changes uh, in, in hospitals. Yeah, she said that the feedback is uh, uh, quite um, quite clear from the uh, floor nurses as she's visited the units that uh, they're pleased and they don't, uh, they're not complaining. They, they, they like this, uh, this availability of information so that, as I said, they can plan their work better. They feel better that they've done a better job and that they left things in a more orderly, tidy, tidy manner for the next, uh, next shift. This is uh, very insightful, Chris. I really appreciate uh, you joining our audio blog. Thanks for, thanks for being here today. It's uh, my pleasure. It's something I'm quite passionate about. How do we improve nursing care so that we can improve the outcomes and experience for the people that we serve, the patients and the families. Thanks, Chris. Very good. Thank you.